Strangulation Romanticist by Nisio Isin Never having been loved is synonymous with never having lived. Dreams don't come true so easily. Well, yeah, I mean, I can barely handle reality. So in other words, all wishes are nearly unattainable. Well, yeah, but not all nearly unattainable things are wishes. That's a fragment of Zirazaki and me. A small sample of our conversation. Even if you aren't a nonsense user like me, anyone who harbors at least a soupçon of doubt about the world must have had a more or less similar experience. An exchange not influenced by cheaply supplied empathy, a pathetic desire to conform, or a miraculously ubiquitous synchronicity, but rather a realm of mirroring that precedes senses and concepts of something just being the way it is. There was no speck of realism, shard of necessity, segment of theorem, or clarification or clownification. Not a single puff of congruence or words like illusion. No solution nor illusion. Not a drop of cogency. Not a shred of common sense. Not a shadow of relevance. Not a note of world harmony. And above all else, no romance. The true comedy of it, however, is that it's not as if nothing happened. And it's a comedy that breeds sorrow, demands compassion, and even has a poignant air. I think he was a regular to begin with. Untouchable. When you think of Zirozaki as being on the other side of a watery surface, that's the only way to comprehend him. Otherwise, there's absolutely no point in trying to put his no longer human existence into words. Then again, regardless of what it may have been, was there any meaning to Zirozaki? Just as your nonsense user overwhelmingly lacks any meaning, expecting to come up with an external judgment about that serial killer is already an exemplarily misguided response wanting an analytic coherence. How do you go about describing that sensation anyway? Akin to facing and exchanging words with oneself that bizarre yet all-too-orthodox core of the tale. Right. So the encounter itself was far-fetched. Maybe it was a primal experience. The very first word we heard. A record to be termed our roots. A past to be likened to association. Vectors with identical origins and directions. As if to precede the everyday as if reflected in a mirror. That is to say, I think we were similar. We were like two congruent figures that required no geometric proof, and we were both incredibly aware of this. From a subjective viewpoint, when we spoke to each other, I was, of course, myself, and Zirozaki was Zirozaki. Neither of us was anything more or less, as we were well aware. Yet we recognized each other, identified with each other, we shared a contradiction beyond the limitations of language. Hence, the other side of reflecting waters. Now, let's introduce an innocent young girl. Her, for instance. Posit that she looks into a mirror for the first time. Surely she doesn't believe that the form before her is a mere reflection of the lights. Instead, she imagines. Without fail, she creates. An endless world on the other side, separated by a single plane. She creates within her a world bearing an enormous contradiction. A perfect replica of here that nonetheless exists in an infinitely distant place. The indulgence that pardons this contradiction isn't ignorance. It matters little which world is real and which is imaginary. If one is true, then the other is false, but if truth is in fact deception, then both have equal value and are equally lacking in value. That's what I think. Sarazaki thought so too. In a sense, our relationship was very much like that. We realized we were the same, but we also understood that we were completely different. I think I could have become like you. That's why I feel a certain affinity. I doubt I could ever become like you. That's what I like about you. Another sample of our conversation. Truly nonsensical. Ultimately. I'm pretty sure we both despised ourselves. 
so we despised our own kin and kind. We hated ourselves, resented ourselves, and cursed ourselves so much that, ironically, we were able to acknowledge each other. I think it was something special. Well, of course it was. Me, the passive bystander, and he, the serial killer. Opposites to a mirror stood between us. Only... When that dreamer of a girl reaches out her graceful hand and touches the mirror even a little, probably all that's there is emptiness. A hollow, scattered feel. What she allowed to exist, someone else didn't. Moreover, the existence that she allowed didn't matter one bit to someone else, she's made to understand. Probably, at that moment, without exaggeration, a world has broken for the girl. So then, this is the tale of one world collapsing. A world falling apart. Without an ultramarine savant or a flaming red's strongest human needing to bring her hand down, but simply from a being there in a fashion. When a fallacy bearing a justified contradiction reigns simultaneously on someone who's no longer human and someone who's a defective product, it all reduces to zero. So then... I made my way to the Donbody corner and placed an order. Excuse me. Large kimchi bowl, please. No rice. The lunch lady gave me a quizzical expression and said, That's just kimchi, son. But she dished it out all the same. As if it were nothing, she plopped it in front of me with an admirable surfeit of professionalism. A heaping, mountainous bowl of kimchi. I doubt there was a single tongue in this world tough enough to chow all that down and still preserve its sense of taste. I nodded with satisfaction, placed the bowl on my tray, and settled the bill. The zone sheet was so empty that I could hardly decide where to sit. In another hour, the place would be filled up with students who would cut out of second period early. I was never a fan of crowds, so I considered myself under a time limit. I took a seat in the corner. Down the hatch, I muttered and took the first bite. It was... Awful.